Good afternoon, everybody. I'd like to welcome you to the National DAV POW MIA seminar. My name is Vincent Darkangelo. I'm the interim committee chairman. And uh, at this time, I'd like to thank you for coming. And I hope you, you learned something today. And it's a very important issue to veterans. And we have a few experts here to tell you all the great work that they're doing to uh, resolve this issue. And uh, first, I'd like to introduce the, uh, the head table. Uh, like myself, I'm the chairman, Vincent Darkangelo. Uh, another committee mem member from the Department of Pennsylvania, Wayne Stratus. Uh, from the Department of California, Dr. Mariano Raba. And from the Department of Texas, Robert Delgado. And also, uh, we have from the DPAA, the Deputy Director, Ms. Fern Sumter Winbush. Glad to have her back again. And also from the Veteran and Family Liaison, also from DPAA in Hawaii, Mr. Stephen Thompson. So that's the head table, and we'll be glad to, uh, after everything is pretty much, the presentation is over, we'll be glad to take questions and answers. And uh, it's, like I said, we have some experts here that will help us with that. Uh, before we get started, does there ha uh, are there any former POWs in the room right now? Any former POWs in the room? If so, stand and recognize. How about former uh, family members of a former POW? Are there? Um, the reason I ask, uh, yes, POWs and MIAs, that's what we're looking for, MIAs. Uh, OK, I don't know if you've donated the DNA sample to the DPAA, but they're doing remarkable things with uh, deep, uh, DNA samples now. And the, from your, they need a family member to donate the sample, and uh, that's how they get the identifications and get answers to your questions. And uh, so if you have not given us a, a DNA sample, I, I would ask, ask you to do so. And we have people here that we can help you after it's over. I'll be glad to explain how you do that. Um, OK, in front of me, in addition to the head table, you see a what we call a chair of honor. It's a, basically a, an empty chair. It's empty because our MIAs aren't here. And draped around it is a POW MIA flag. And, uh, You've seen, the, if you were at the memorial service this morning, you've seen the, the explanation of the POW table. And uh, I don't know, I, I, I don't, uh, one of the th purposes of this committee is to bring awareness to the POW MIA issue. And we hope that, we're, we're finding out that some departments don't even have a POW MIA committee. Now, I know I'm from the P Department of Pennsylvania, and at our state headquarters building, Whenever anybody walks into the headquarters, and we have a couple service officers there, we have a lot of traffic, the first thing they see when they go in the door is a POW table permanently set up there. And so I hope that every, every meeting you go to, every DAV chapter meeting, every Ameri if you belong to the American Legion and VFW and, and uh, uh, AMVETS, every meeting you go to, I, I hope there's a POW table or an empty chair, or, uh, some way to recognize the POWs. Uh, okay, I think we're going to get on with it. I'm going to, in the main course of business, I'm going to introduce Ms. Fern Sumter Winbush. Fern was, um, she's the deputy director of the DPAA. On, in 2015, she was uh, selected to serve as the principal deputy director for the DPAA. DPAA, by the way, is Defense Department POW MIA Accounting Agency. In support of the director, DPAA, she is responsible for leading the agency in formulating policy, overseeing business development, and increasing outreach initiatives to achieve the agency's goal of providing families and the nation with the fullest possible accounting of missing personnel from past conflicts. Mrs. Winbush hails from Boston, Massachusetts, where she was a 1989 honor graduate of the University of Massachusetts and a distinguished military graduate of Suffolk, Uni Suffolk University's ROTC program in Boston. She began her military career as a private first class in the Army Reserves in 1983. Her service continued upon her transfer to the Massachusetts Army National Guard until her active duty appointment as a military intelligence second lieutenant in 1990. 
Over the next 25 years, she held numerous positions of increased responsibility in Germany, Saudi Arabia, Iraq, Korea, and the Netherlands, and culminating with a deployment to Operation Enduring Freedom in Kabul, Afghanistan, and subsequently as the commander of Joint Base Meyer Henderson Hall in Arlington, Virginia. Ms. Wunbush retired from the Army after 31 years of military service in January of 2015. Her education includes a Bachelor of Science degree with honors in Business Management Information Systems from the University of Massachusetts, a Master of Science degree in National Resource Strategy from the Industrial College of the Armed Forces. Her, also, her awards and decorations include the Legion of Merit, First Oak Leaf Cluster, Distinguished Meritorious Service Medal, Meritorious Service Medals, Sixth Oak Leaf Cluster, the Army Commendation Medal, the Joint Service Achievement Medal, First Oak Leaf Cluster, and the Army Achievement Medal. Ms. Wimbush is married and has one son. Please welcome from DPAA the Deputy Director, Mrs. Fern Sumter Wimbush. Since I think these podiums get taller every time I come, it feels taller anyway, or maybe I'm getting shorter due to my <laughs> age. Good afternoon, DAV. Good afternoon, POWMIA committee. And those of you who are interested in this mission and in all of the efforts that the Defense POWMIA Accounting Agency is responsible for. As Vince mentioned, our mission is critically important not just for the families who continue to wait for their loved ones to come home, but for us to bring home and to fulfill those promises that we made to those unreturned veterans. And then I would also add, probably just as important, this um, demonstrates for servicemen and women who are serving today, that if they go down, we won't stop looking for them. Before I get started, I want to first thank Vince. Vince and I are in email communication pretty regularly, probably more often than most. And I want to thank you because you answered a call, you took care of the agency, you're one of those individuals that when asked, you don't ask why me, but you act. And so because of you, DPAA is better positioned and for FY18, our budget is solid and secure and in fact, we got a $15 million ad, so thank you so much. <laughs> Next slide, please. If we could just take a moment, um, just to have a moment of silence to acknowledge those who have fallen, to acknowledge those who are still serving in harm's way today, and then to remember those who haven't come home that DPAA and others in the accounting community are currently searching for. Please join me in a moment of silence. Rarely do we have an opportunity like today to just pause. It's unfortunate, but there aren't a lot of Americans, frankly, that know about this mission. Many of them, however, were awakened over the past month or so when our president had a meeting with Chairman Kim. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about Korea in a minute, so I don't wanna get ahead of myself. But what's most important, if you don't get anything out of today, First, remember that DPAA is committed, we're still looking, and that we need you to help us spread the word, not just to your peers, but to the next generation, because they are the ones that are gonna continue to carry this mission forward. In 2014, then Secretary of Defense Hagel directed the consolidation of the accounting community into a single agency led by a senior executive. Last year, 
Major General retired Kelly McCaig became our current director, DPAA. As his deputy, he and I walk arm in arm every day in the D.C. area throughout the halls of the Pentagon and Congress fighting for this mission, taking care of the promises that our nation have, has made to our fallen heroes. Out in Hawaii, we have our regional, uh, excuse me, our deputy director for operations, Rear Admiral Kreitz. He heads all operations for DPAA to include operations abroad as well as disinterments. And then of course, our senior enlisted advisor, because where would any of us be without a good NCO taking care of us? So our Major Swam, he's also out in uh, Hawaii as well. This is the DPAA leadership team. We are proud to serve and we are dedicated. Next slide. Our mission is a daunting one, to provide the fullest possible accounting for our servicemen and women, DOD civilians and contractors, designated contractors, who were lost during past conflicts. Our vision, we live every single day. Our values are steadfast. We are a team of committed, compassionate, dedicated professionals who work every day with compassion for families and with integrity. This job is not too hard for us because every single day we remember someone who has fallen from a past conflict. Throughout the year, we meet with families and with other service organizations such as the DAV, and we draw our strengths from you because you all remind us just how critically important this mission is. What I'd like to do is give you a quick look into the life of DPAA personnel with a short video. It's only nine minutes, but it'll give you a better idea of exactly what our men and women do every single day. Can you play the video, please? Since I was told you were the expert. My military assistant, Major Field, is truly the expert. There we go. Thanks. We write no last chapters. We close no books. We put away no final memories. An end to America's involvement in Vietnam cannot come before we have achieved the fullest possible accounting of those missing in action. Why keep searching? The answer is simple. You never leave a fallen American behind. The mission of the Defense POW MIA Accounting Agency or DPAA, is to provide the fullest possible accounting for our missing personnel to their families and their nation. Strategically located in Arlington, Virginia, with major facilities at Joint Base Pearl Harbor, Hickam, Hawaii, and Offutt Air Force Base, Nebraska, the more than 600-person newly established defense agency is jointly manned by soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines and Department of Defense civilians with specialized skills. Researching, recovering, identifying, and ultimately returning an individual to their family begins with analysis and investigation. The DPAA experts begin the search by studying all known information regarding the circumstances of each loss. Historians and analysts gather information from U.S. veterans, foreign witnesses, archival records, and other sources. They then create a case file for each unaccounted for American. This file may include historical records, official correspondence, maps, photographs, daily activity logs, and medical and personnel records of the missing person. These files are continually updated until an identification is made. Once the research has been done here, 
uh, and we get the command's approval, we'll, we send out small teams, it could be up two people, it could be a 10 person team, uh, conducting interviews at a, at a villager's house, at a district office, or in a combination of their, of going to the site first and, and then conducting the interviews on site. Once all available information is analyzed, a decision can be made to disinter individuals buried as unknown or conduct field investigations. During a typical investigation mission, personnel interview potential witnesses, conduct on-site reconnaissance, and survey terrain for safety and logistical concerns. Teams also try to generate new leads that may result in future recoveries. The main goal of the investigation is to obtain enough information to correlate or connect a particular site with one or more missing Americans. If enough on-site evidence is found, the site will be recommended for recovery and excavation. Recovery sites range in size from a few square meters, such as in individual burials, to areas larger than football fields for aircraft crashes. DPAA may hire as many as 100 local workers to help with the excavation process. This job has so many benefits. For me personally, it's an opportunity to serve the country, but also our fighting forces and kind of contribute to that as well. Professionally, it's just an incredible challenge to get to work in all the countries where we work, to travel to these amazing sites, uh, to work with the local villagers and local officials, uh, and just have the opportunity to give somebody some answers after decades of waiting to know what happened to their loved one and you know maybe just wrestling with the grief that that lack of information and lack of answers brings, we have the chance to resolve that for them. And, and that's just an incredible opportunity. Investigative and recovery missions in search of missing Americans take DPAA personnel to distant, remote, and often dangerous locations all over the globe. Rice paddies in Southeast Asia, areas on the Korean Peninsula, 16,000 foot mountaintops in the Himalayas, and underwater sites off the coast of Papua New Guinea. And we still continue to search the battlefields of World War II throughout Europe. After a successful recovery, all evidence is then transported to the DPAA laboratories. Once they've arrived in the lab, the painstaking process of identification begins. This is the final step of the mission, leading to the return of an individual in many of the cases, an important step in the identification process is DNA analysis, which is accomplished by cutting a bone sample that is sent to the Armed Forces DNA Identification Laboratory. One of the challenges DPAA faces today is the lack of reference samples from family members of those still unaccounted for. Any person who is a relative of an unaccounted for American is encouraged to contact their service casualty office to ensure there is a DNA reference sample on file for that service member. DPAA makes an identification when all available evidence remains, artifacts and historical documents point to the same person. The ID process can take anywhere from a few months to several years to complete. Any unresolved cases are kept open with the hope that new evidence will be found or new technologies will be developed to make a future identification possible. Once an American has been identified, there remains a return to their family through their respective service casualty office. They are returned home with full military honors and given the respect they earn through their service and sacrifice for their country. Oh, as a family member, this agency to me is doing phenomenal work and in a very personal way because when somebody loses somebody like my father and you really don't know what the story is for 70 years and then you find an agency that knows about him and keeps his his memory alive keeps the mission alive to try to find him it's very meaningful in a very personal way because it means you're not just doing this yourself alone. You have a whole body of people who are concerned about finding your dad and bringing him home.
it, it's just I'm so grateful because not only you, our kids and everything else are fully aware that my brother is somewhere and we are going to find him. It's all a matter of working, working hard and then the good Lord will find a small miracle and it turns into a better miracle. And I'm so, and as long as I live, I'll never give up on that miracle. I just wanted to yell to openly to everybody out there, he's home, he's home. I couldn't believe it. And when I went up and touched his name, I thought, you're home, you're home. It's unbelievable. I'm glad I live in the United States of America and that we have this attitude. Leave no man behind. We are, we're so fortunate. I want you to know, and I know from my own experience, that if something's happened to you, we will be looking for you. The men and women of the Defense POW MIA Accounting Agency are united in their effort to recover and return as many of our missing personnel as possible. One more patriot return, one more family that now has answers. One more step in fulfilling our nation's promise. Our, our um, national commander has arrived. I'm going to ask her to come in. By the way, I forgot to mention, we have a committee advisor. Uh, the good looking guy in the back there, Justin Hart, he's the committee advisor. And there's another, we have another committee advisor, Shane Learman, and he couldn't be here for this afternoon. But uh, National Commander uh, Metcalf Foster, would you come on up here? <laughs> Commander, uh, we're continuing a tradition we started a few years ago uh, the outgoing commander is a way of our gratitude, showing our gratitude and saying thanks you for your support of this committee in our effort to do the DAV's part. Here's a brand new POW. Oh my gosh, thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you so much. And I want to thank all of you for your support through the years. I would not be where I am today if I didn't get the support that I have from the DAV and all my friends here, and I'll always remember that. Um, I always say it's never a big I and a little you. We all work together, and I wish you nothing but the best, and if I can do anything for anyone, please feel free to reach out, even though my new business card is going to read PNC, <laughs> PSC, and in the middle it says MIA. <laughs> Uh, for those that don't know, Delphine Metcalf Foster was the first female to ever lead a major veteran organization, and uh, we congratulate her for that. And not only the DAV, I mean any of them, she's the first one. And she has led this organization very well the, in, in her year. Okay, Ms. Ms. Wimbish, here we go again. Yep, that's it. Okay, I'm gonna pick up the pace a little bit because the video um, covered a bit of what I'm gonna talk about, so I'm gonna advance pretty quickly so that Steve Thompson can come behind, come behind me and give you really the other important piece of what we wanna talk about today. So this slide just gives you an idea of the scope of the effort. Over 82,000 missing. Many of them are deep sea losses or um, high-speed air crash, 
losses, and many of them we won't ever be able to recover, and we understand that. So we assess that, uh, that there are about 34,000 remaining that we think we can actually get to and recover. The agency, as the video said, 600 strong. We have anthropologists, forensic anthropologists, archaeologists, researchers, um, explosive ordnance personnel, especially as we go and um, conduct field recovery operations in Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia, especially along the Ho Chi Minh Trail. As you know, that's heavily bombed. So we have our own um, ordnance personnel and a whole host of other professions um, that are required to, to execute this mission. Last year, thanks to the hard work of not only our scientists, but our researchers and our personnel in the, in the field, and then also support from organizations like the DAV, we met the highest number of identifications in the history of the accounting uh, mission, 201 identified. What that really means is not 201 individuals, that means 201 families have been contacted or will be contacted and given the, ultim the ultimate miracle. Their loved one is coming home, their uncle, their brother, their father. It's really an awesome, awesome experience for us, those of us who work this mission every single day. And I will tell you, much as I said before when I spoke to the DAV, we're going to well exceed 2017 because we have to and because the families expect us to. We are already in 2018 well on our way to blowing 201 out of the water. So you heard it here first. Next slide. This is just a quick snapshot to show you how our um, identification successes over the years have progressed. And so the far right of the slide sh starts from 1946 all the way to 2018. So be of course, 2018 is not over yet. Uh, so we've got a little way to go before we surpass the 2017 numbers. But what I want you to take away from this slide is the light blue at the bottom is Vietnam War accounting. I'm sorry. The light blue is Korean War accounting. As soon as I said it, I knew it was wrong. I had to figure out how to back, back up. <laughs> Korean War accounting. As you can see, the numbers have increased yearly with Korean War because we did a large Korean disinterment project that we are continuing to work on. I'm going to talk a little bit more about Korea in a, in a minute. The green bars are Vietnam identifications. So early on, we were able to get quite a number of identifications annually. But you know, as the acidic soil, urbanization, and other elements in Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia have whittled away at those remains, we don't quite have the ability to recover as many as we used to. And so those that we do recover, oftentimes, are, they're very difficult to get um, DNA out of. And so the numbers are dwindling. Because of that, we are keeping Vietnam as the focus for the next couple of years so that we can get as many remains out of the ground out of Southeast Asia as possible before, we have, before there's nothing less left. The darker blue bars are World War II, so through our disinterment program, but also <coughs> recovery efforts in Europe. Um, we've been able to increase our World War II accounting as well. Next slide. When I talked a little bit about our priorities, our main effort right now, as I said, is, world, is uh, Vietnam, our Vietnam operations. But in addition to that, you know, one of the biggest challenges for an agency is database management. And we have talked a lot over the past three years that I've been associated with DPAA about a case management system. Well, we are here. Case management system will be fully operational in December of this year. We're using it right now. It's a internal program of software that our analysts, researchers, anthropologists, and scientists use to share information, but also to digitize and preserve a lot of those fragile documents and um, photographs that if we leave them um, on the shelves where they are right now, they will continue to deteriorate and be of no use to us in the future. So we have a huge scanning effort afoot to not only ingest 
those documents and images, but we also have this case management system that we're going to be using, not just internal to DPAA, but also with the service casualty offices and some of our partners so that we can properly share information and develop that case, uh, that service member's case file that Congress and frankly the families have been demanding for years. And so we're getting much closer. Steve Thompson is going to talk to you about the public portal, so I'm not going to touch on that uh, here. We continue to grow, next slide, our public-private partnerships. Over the last three years, we have grown this effort to over 130 either active or in the works partnerships. We have partnered with organizations such as History Flight that I'm sure many of you have heard of. They are working on recovering the, the Marines from uh, Tarawa. Hugely successful partnership for us. They have really um, done an outstanding job. In addition, as I talked about in Europe, we are also uh, partnering with, in the bottom right hand photo is a picture of a young man who is a student with the University of Pennsylvania. We've partnered with Pennsylvania, with the University of Innsbruck, Austria, and the World War II Museum, and we last year conducted a highly successful, to be announced, uh, mission in Austria where we recovered remains. And we believe, we're hopeful, that these remains will be of a Tuskegee Airman that went down during World War II. <laughs> and then of course, we continue to partner with organizations that have underwater expertise, uh, Woods Hole, the Croatian Navy, and the National Park Service partnered with us this past year. We conducted an underwater recovery, which is pictured in that top left photo in Croatia to recover uh, another uh, set of remains. And so with our partners, they, not only do they bring the expertise, but they also give us the ability to do much more Right, because we, 600 sounds like a lot of people, but it's not a lot of people when you have only a handful of anthropologists, a handful of archeologists, and then the rest are researchers and support. We need people who can put their hands in the dirt, who can dig, who can dive deep, and help us recover those remains. And so th our partners give us that extra um, bit of personnel and resources to help us get after this very, very challenging mission uh, in a much better way. Next slide. And then this just gives you an idea of just how vast our partnering effort has been. Uh, this slide shows a, a map of the US and then shows by state where we have partners. Next slide. Like I said, I'm gonna move quickly so I can get Steve up here. These are our upcoming events. Steve Thompson is from our Outreach and Communications Directorate, responsible for not only reaching out to organizations such as this, but also uh, to families and family groups. Listed on the slide are our upcoming events. I'd like to invite everybody in this room to Washington, D.C. on the 21st of September for the POW MIA Recognition Day. The Secretary of Defense, Secretary Mattis, has agreed to host that event, so I can guarantee you it will be awesome. We've had guest speakers in the past, congressmen and women, former POWs, MIAs, and this year, Secretary Mattis has agreed to host. So please come out, show your support, and hear our Secretary of Defense. And then I would also like to put the board on notice, so I'm not gonna hide behind an email. <laughs> put the board on notice and invite you to one of our current family member updates, right, where you can actually come and not only hear this same set of remarks again, given by much more experienced individuals than, than me, but also hear from the families. We have, during the family member updates, we have a um, moment of remembrance where family members, if they're comfortable, and many of them are, if they're comfortable to stand up behind the mic and tell us about their loss. It is hugely moving. So. I can't, I can't invite all of DAV because it really is only for the families. So I can, however, invite the POW MIA committee to, and you can go to anyone. One that's- in Philadelphia, yeah. that's right around the corner. Exactly, it's, so please, please come. 
Next slide. With, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Steve Thompson, who's going to give you the outreach and communications perspective of the DPAA mission. Steve? Thank, Thank you. you. Well, good, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, as I've already been introduced, my name is Steve Thompson. Uh, and as Vince mentioned at the beginning of the meeting, uh, I'm, I'm a family and veteran liaison. So what does that mean? I mean, I, it's exactly as the title says. I, I liaison with families uh, of our unaccounted for service members and with the veterans organizations, uh, VFW, American Legion, DAV, Special Forces Association, Special Operations Association, so on and so on. Uh, we work with uh, all these organizations on a, on a very uh, close basis. So I'm going to talk about uh, what we want you to know, which is that we're not just sitting behind our, our desks and our, our closed doors, either, either in D.C. or in Hawaii. We're out. We're talking to f uh, veterans groups. We're talking to families and family organizations. We want you to know what we're doing on, on your behalf. So that's what I'm going to talk about. So you've heard the, uh, mentioned already uh, family member updates. Uh, Vince has already promised to come to the one in Philadelphia in September. We'll see you there. You can show me Philadelphia. Um, so th these are our these are a great opportunity uh, for family members and, and, and for us. So we ha we hold these eight times a year in different locations around the country. Uh, on our website, uh, if you want to write it down, it's www.dpaa.mil. And I'll, I'll show you what's on the website here in a minute. But on there, you can find uh, uh, the uh, 2018 and 2019 uh, schedule for the FMUs is already online. You can see, you can see those. Uh, since 1995, when we started this program, we've had over 19,000 family members that have attended. Uh, it's, an, it's an all day long affair. Uh, we're quite tired, uh, I can promise you, at the end of the day. Uh, but you get briefings, you'll get a nice welcome by Mrs. Wimbush. Uh, you get policy briefings, you get operations briefings. Uh, briefings by scientists who are actually doing the work, uh, briefings by the head of the DNA laboratory, uh, and they're really, a lot of the family members, especially if, if it's their first time, they're actually quite overwhelmed. They're like, wow, this is a lot to take in in, in one time. So we said, well, we, that's why we encourage you to come back. Uh, one of the best things about these meetings is we have, we have an opportunity to meet in a one-on-one -on -one setting uh, with family members. So, um, and, and they come in, in different varieties. So, for, for example, World War II, uh, you see more and more uh, nieces, nephews, uh, you know, second, third generations. You see grand nephews, grand nieces, not, not, not necessarily people who knew the casualty, but you've got, you know, families go down the line. So they tend to know a little bit less about the, what we're doing and about the loss. As you get closer to the loss, like, say, Vietnam War, you know, we get mothers that, that come to these, mothers who are still waiting for their sons to come home. We get brothers and sisters. We get wives. We get, certainly get children. Uh, so we get in that one-on-one -on -one, uh, meeting setting, we get an opportunity to sit down and say, okay, Mrs. Mrs. Jones, uh, or in a lot of cases, we know these families personally. We've developed friendships with them over the years, and we sit down and we go over, you know, whatever questions they may have. Okay, last time we met, we told you we were going to do an investigation uh, and that we were looking for this witness. We can give them an update face-to-face -face on, on, on what occurred since the last time we met. We normally get 150 to 250 family members uh, at each of these meetings. Uh, that really depends normally on, on where we are. I think in Rapid City we had uh, less than 100, uh, but that's fine. You know, we're, we're, that's okay. Um, and I just added this bullet, uh, the last bullet, that, uh, bullet there this morning. So what we've done uh, in the last year or so, we've invited senior members of the VFW, the American Legion, uh, to come and, and send a couple of uh, department officers. So we invite DAV to do the same thing. Vince is gonna probably, will probably be the first uh, to do that. Uh, but again, we want to have the point is we want to have a closer relationship with uh, DAV uh, and and continue our our, our uh, collaboration. Slide, please, Vince. Okay. In addition to the family member updates, we hold two annual government briefings. One is for the Vietnam War families. That's in conjunction with the National League of Families, uh, and that's in July. We had held that last June. I'm sorry, last month. Uh, and then next month in D.C., we'll hold the uh, annual meeting for the Korean War and Cold War families. Uh, we normally get about 400 uh, Korean War families showing up for that meeting. 
uh, with all the news about uh, what's going on uh, between President Bush and Chairman Kin. Uh, we're expecting large, large numbers. I think we're well over 450 or, already, so that's going to be a large meeting. Um, one of the benefits of this is that the, the, the government will fund the travel for two family members. <coughs> that, that's, that's done through the, the service casualty office. So if you're, if you're uh, missing a, a loved one is a soldier, then the Army would, would, would handle that, uh, all those arrangements for you. Again, we have one-on-one -on -one meetings, so you can sit down with an analyst, go over your case. Uh, and, and anywhere from 200 to 400 family members attend those annual meetings. Uh, but again, Korea, uh, this year we expect it to be uh, uh, much higher. Slide, please, Mr. Okay, one thing we love doing uh, in Hawaii is, is hosting family visits. Uh, so the gentleman in the top right uh, photograph there, uh, I, I forget the relationship, but he, he had a family member who was uh, uh, unaccounted for. We met him at a family meeting. He said, geez, I'd love to come to Hawaii. We said, well, we'll you know, let us know when you're coming and, and we'll give you the you know, uh, dollar tour. Uh, so the, typically a family member comes out, we give them an orientation tour, we take them to the laboratory where they have a, uh, one of our anthropologists give them a, a, a presentation on how they go about making identifications. Uh, and in some cases, family members come out to receive the re identified remains of their loved one. Normally that's an active duty person, so if, if somebody uh, in your family, uh, somebody in the family of an unaccounted for individual is, is still in uniform, that individual can come out as special escort, they're put on, on orders, and that's their place of duty. They come out and they escort, escort those remains uh, back to the mainland for uh, internment wherever the family chooses. Normally that's Arlington, but that, that's a family decision. And the bottom right uh, photograph there is, those are, uh, uh, that's an identified individual leaving our, our facility. And you can see we get uh, civilian staff, we get military to come out and pay their respects as this individual is making his way home to his family. In fact, this coming Tuesday morning we have the husband of a grand niece of an individual killed at the Chosen Reservoir uh, has been identified and the, and, and the family's coming out to receive his remains. And I, I believe he's going to Arlington as well. Slide, please. Okay, this is something M Mrs. Wimbush is very inv involved in. Uh, and again, this is our way to reach out to you folks and push information out to your leadership so you know what we're doing on your behalf. Like I said, we're not sitting behind our closed doors or you know, on our military facilities. We want you to know what we're doing. So once a quarter, there's a big conference call uh, uh, headed by the, uh, led, led by, on our half by the director. He, uh, we got VFW, Murray Legion, DAV, VVA, uh, families of, family groups from Vietnam War, Korean War, so on and so on. And, and we have this conference call and we give them an update on, on, on budget, on operations, on policy, whatever uh, needs to be discussed. Uh, in addition to that, we, we uh, post on our webpage, and I'll show you that in a second, uh, that, that a, a similar update. So even if you're not, uh, you know, uh, the, you're not Vince here and you're not dialing in to, to, to be part of that conference call, you can go on our webpage and see essentially the same information. Slide, please. Okay, uh, Mrs. Wimbush already mentioned National PWMIA uh, Recognition Day. Uh, uh, DC always holds their, uh, their uh, ceremony at the Pentagon. I'm told it's a beautiful ceremony in Hawaii. We have ours, we, we, we love it. Again, the same veterans groups that I've, I've mentioned repeatedly now show up, DAV shows up. Uh, uh, the uh, two individuals you see there from VFW, they come, we have a beautiful ceremony. Uh, there's a eulogy, uh, a, a, a clergy member giving some kind of uh, a benediction type thing. We, if we've had P return POWs, we've had family members, we've had all kinds of guest speakers come out and, and share their experience. And then the last thing at the, at the end of the ceremony is the wreath laying. Uh, last, last year, I think we had about 30 different groups. Uh, again, veterans groups, uh, civic organizations, the governor, uh, state representatives, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, it's, it, it's, it's quite a big deal and it's, 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 it's uh, really nice. If you're ever in Hawaii, uh, third Friday of uh, uh, September, any year, please come on out. Slide. Okay, uh, kind of like what we're doing here today, uh, we do this every year. We uh, attend the VFW American Legion uh, DAV conventions and we, and we meet with their members and we educate them and, and let them know what we're doing on your behalf. Slide. Okay, this is uh, something, uh, this is really cool. So for example, the top, uh, uh, top right-hand photograph there is uh, that's Cliff Newman. Cliff Newman was an Army Special Forces soldier, uh, served in Vietnam, uh, both uh, with 5th uh, uh, Group and uh, Mac V. Sog. Uh, the reason uh, you see a picture of, of Cliff there in Vietnam, Cliff was on the Bright Light mission for RT Intruder. 
which was lost just west of, of the, uh, uh, the west side of the Asha Valley on the Vietnam-Lao border. So Cliff was on the ground uh, the day, a day or so after our recon team intruder went missing. Cliff has now been back with us three times uh, to help us find that site. He just came back, uh, got back to Fort Bragg, I think like two weeks ago. Uh, we finally found the site. So that's a great story. Cliff, Cliff is a great guy. You won't know it by looking at the photograph, but <coughs> Cliff, Cliff lost the lower half of his left leg when he stepped on a mine uh, his last tour in Vietnam. Uh, you'd never know by the way he gets around. He's a pretty Im impressive guy. Uh, bottom right-hand corner, uh, pictures of Larry Page and John Caviani. Uh, both of these Special Forces soldiers were at a place called Hickory. It was an NSA a listening post. Uh, so they had, you know, uh, it kind of an enemy territory, so they had it heavily guarded. Uh, NVA uh, came in with a brigade side, side, size unit, and they said, well, you know, we're not going to win this. So they pulled everybody off. Uh, during the last moments of uh, our occupation there, a, a soldier named Jones w was killed. John Caviani was the only American uh, uh, left at, at the site uh, when Jones was killed. So we took Larry Page, who had just been evacuated before the NVA hit, and they went back and they helped us find the bunker where Jones was, was uh, last seen, where we suspected he was killed. We recovered Jones' remains, and he was identified about four years ago. By the way, John Caviani was captured uh, at that battle, uh, spent the remainder of the war uh, in a uh, prison up in Hanoi, uh, and came home and was later rec recognized as, and re received the Medal of Honor. He, he's, he's gone now, but so we got him, uh, but we got him before uh, he passed. Slide. Okay, I mentioned our, our public website. So again, www.dpaa.mil. If you go to the, um, if you look at the top, you see the, the top left-hand corner is our logo. Down and over to over one, it says families. You click on that, and that's our family web, or fam web, we're calling it. It, the intent is to push information out to family members, but anybody can actually go on there and see it. So the information you'll see, you'll see on there, it, it, so once you go into FamWeb, there's four tabs. Fa well, welcome to FamWeb, quarterly updates, and so on the, on the first tab, is, 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 which is the picture that you see right there, you can see recent identifications, you can see our ID count for the current fiscal year, you can see where we have teams currently deployed around the world. You go to the next tab, quarterly update. I mentioned that uh, uh, our director and Mrs. Wimbush participate in a quarterly uh, conference call with all the, uh, uh, our stakeholders. And so the, the, the information that is shared during that, that, that uh, telephone conference is, is also posted here. So anybody can go on there and, and, and see the latest information. Slide please, okay. Um, the next, next tab over is service members profile. Again, you can, anybody can see this. You can go on there, you, if you have a, an individual you knew was unaccounted for, uh, you, you can search his name. You can search by home of record, by state. You can search by uh, date of loss. You can search by country of loss. All of this information is, is, is available. Uh, and then the last tab, uh, family member update, you can go in there, you can see the schedule. Currently we have posted schedules for uh, 2018, 2019. Uh, there's hotel information if you're a family member and you want to register. And there's also contact information for your service casualty office. And I think Mrs. Wimbush already mentioned this, so I'll, I'll emphasize this. If you know anybody who has uh, an unaccounted for service member in their family, their initial point of contact is not DPAA, it's the service casualty office. So if they were a soldier, it's the Army casualty office of uh, Fort Knox, Kentucky. If they're a Marine, then it's, it's the Marine casualty office of Quantico. So that's the family member's first stop. So if, if, if anybody stops you and says, hey, uh, you know, I'm a family member and I'm, I'm looking for information, you know, they can go to our website, they can find this inf contact information, but their first contact should be with the service casualty office. Okay, slide. Okay, I'm gonna talk, uh, highlight for a few minutes uh, the great things that all of our smart uh, uh, scientific staff folks are doing. Okay, so uh, when we make identifications, we, we develop uh, multiple lines of evidence. A line of evidence is a, is a, is a piece of the puzzle, if you would. Sometimes we have all those pieces of puzzle when we get the remains and we can make an identification fairly quickly. In other cases, in most cases, it takes us time to put these, this puzzle back together. So every time you get a piece of evidence, maybe it's a DNA match, that's a line of evidence. So when, the, when remains come into our laboratory, the anthropologist develops a biological profile, which is normally uh, age, height, race, sex. But sometimes, depending on the remains, the amount of remains you have, that may be an easy task or it may be a very difficult task. 
So we look for, again, for multiple lines of evidence before we can make an identification. So about 10 years ago, we had this uh, anthropologist, incredibly smart guy, and he said, you know, guys, I had this idea that clavicles are unique to each of us, much like a fingerprint, similar to DNA. So he commenced this study, and he was right. So now this is an accepted tool in the forensic community that was developed in our laboratory to help us make identifications. Uh, this, was, this whole project was kind of spurred on by the, by the fact that when we, when we started working on Korean War unknowns buried at the Punchbowl Cemetery in Hawaii, we were unable to get a, D, get a DNA sequence. We found out later that the remains had been uh, uh, treated with a formaldehyde-based solution at the Army mortuary in Japan during the Korean War. So that formaldehyde created a chemical, like a chemical uh, bond that, that our, our DNA scientists could not uh, uh, break. So the, uh, so the end run was kind of, well, well, if we can't get DNA out of these remains, we need to develop another line of evidence. That line of evidence became, is, is what you see up here. So by, by, by comparing uh, x-rays, uh, taken uh, TB x-rays, chest x-rays, taken at the induction of the individual to determine, you know, see if he, if he qualified for military service. If he had TB, then he wasn't qualified. So we got a, a vast majority, maybe like 98%, I'm not sure what the exact number is, of the x-rays of individuals who were inducted into the Army or into the military during the Korean War. We now use those x-rays and compare them against Korean War unknowns. Okay, slide. Okay, this is brand new, brand spanking new. So again, another line of evidence is now isotope analysis. So an isotope is a variation of a standard chemical element, like carbon or nitrogen. We all in ingest these things in water and, and in the food that we eat. Well, it turns out that these variations of isotopes are different depending on where you live. And you can use that to determine the origin of the remains. So we have remains in the laboratory, and it's a white guy. He's six foot, 11 and a half. He's 18 to 22 years old. I don't have, a, maybe I don't have a DNA match, but, I've, but, I, but I can use isotope. And maybe I've got two possibilities. I got, I got two in, men that are missing from the Korean War. They both match the, the profile. One's from Washington State and one's from New York. But what am I gonna do? So you can use isotope analysis to determine the origin of that individual based on what they drank, what they ate as, as a child. So the, the results come back and oh, this individual uh, uh, has characteristics of somebody who grew up in, in the no northwest part of the United States. Well, it's this individual. So again, you can't make an identification off of this one single piece of information, but if you put it together and you develop multiple lines of evidence, then that allow, will allow, allow you to go forward and make the identification. Again, this is brand, brand new. We're still developing this capability in our laboratory in Hawaii. Uh, Dr. Tom Holland, who runs uh, our strategic partnership program, uh, tells me that he's working on developing this uh, with uh, uh, outside partners who are smart on this. Uh, so we're really, we're really excited about this. Slide, please. Okay, unknowns. I think Mrs. Wimbush mentioned unknowns. Uh, so uh, after World War II, after Korean War, there were roughly 8,500 individuals buried uh, at, at different uh, cemeteries around the world, American cemeteries, ABMC uh, and Punchbowl Cemetery in, in Hawaii. So the advances, and I've explained a couple of them already, are now are allowing us to make identifications of individuals who have laid as unknown since World War II, since the Korean War. Uh, one good thing about this is we have access to all the graves. It's an American cemetery. All we have to do is coordinate with the local cemetery administration and say, hey, we want to dig up, so we want to disinter this, this grave because we believe we know who that individual is, and we make the coordination, and, and it's, it's fairly simple. Uh, so the folks that are working on this, we have historians that are going back looking at records of cemeteries, mortuaries, trying to put piece together where do these remains actually come from, which, which would help us make the identification. And then we have scientists that are looking, comparing at uh, the list of individuals this, these remains could possibly be associated to, and then they come up with a, with a recommendation, and then we do the disinterment. Slide, please. So here are the current numbers of individuals that we've identified, um, uh, who, men who were previously unknowns. 
Uh, and most of this is in the last couple of years, if I, if I can point that out. So again, the science allows us, the, the advancement of forensic science allows us to make identifications today that just five, 10 years ago, we would not have been able to make. Now, US Oklahoma, US Oklahoma went down at, uh, 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 in Pearl Harbor, uh, December 7, 1941. Uh, there were 397 sailors and Marines on board. And we've now identified 143 of them. We, they were all disinterred. They were all in our, our laboratory in Hawaii. And we've identified 143 so far. And that work continues. Uh, Taro had 27 IDs. And, and, and you can read the rest. But a total of 355 individuals who were previously interred as unknowns have now been identified. Slide, please. OK, so where are we? Where are we working? The, this is uh, our current uh, uh, plan for 2018. You see we're in 24 countries, Asia, uh, Europe, South Pacific, we're all, we're all over the place. Slide. Okay, uh, you can see the level of effort. This slide does two things. One, you can see the level of effort on the left side. You can see where we're putting our emphasis. And again, Mrs. Wimbush mentioned that Vietnam War is our priority, and she explained why that, you know, we have we had this uh, uh, soil acidity problem in Southeast Asia that we don't, we don't face that problem anywhere else. So we're actually losing the remains in, in Southeast Asia. They're being dissolved slowly. So that's why our, as, uh, what, primarily why our emphasis is still on Southeast Asia. Okay, slide next, please. Okay, this is our operational plan for next year. Uh, these are the uh, places and uh, numbers of teams and, uh, that we, ha we plan on uh, sending out. We may, uh, we, uh, obviously, we, we may add North Korea to that. We'll, we'll see. Don't know yet. I'm gonna come up right now. Okay, yeah. all right. Okay, I'm, I'm getting the hook, so. Uh, 